Hey everyone, my name is Eli Davis, and I'd like to share with you a project I've been building over the past few months in my free time. Um, it was meant to be a wall decoration with lights that as you walk past it, it's supposed to look like fireflies are near you. Um, and over time, I got the idea to add a camera to it and turning it into a security device. So uh, I'm going to show you the process of building it and um, exactly what I did right and wrong and what you could do to make modifications to it if you wanted to build your own. Um, the security system uses something called Telegram to alert me. It's just a messaging app, but uh, because there's distance sensors already there, uh, if I set it into security mode and the distance sensors get a reading, uh, then it knows that someone's there and it automatically will take a photo or video and send it to me, um, alerting me. Yeah, I hope you enjoy this uh, kind of breakdown on what has to happen in the programming, uh, and thanks for watching. So when it first came to designing this project, uh, there was a lot of questions I had in my mind. You know, how many lights should I use? Where should I place these lights? What colors should they be? Uh, and the different effects they display. So like the fade in and fade out, what rate and whatnot. So before I sat down and tried building it um, and playing around with it physically, I remade the entire thing in Unity, um, which is pretty easy. Uh, at work, we're using the HDRP system, so I wanted to take advantage and try to get better at that, and so that's what you see here. Um, so just to show you kind of like my thought processes, I eventually decided on eight lights, what I thought looked good. Um, but you'll notice that uh, this array, uh, you know, is sizable, so I can, you know, add or remove lights um, and I tried coding everything so that it didn't know the number of lights a priori. This when I translated from C sharp to Python code uh, didn't look too nice too pretty but um, also the lattice in the Python program is generic so if you wanted to build your own and you added more or less lights um, my code would take into account for that. Some of the things I can play around with are you know, like color, intensity, and whatnot. So uh, we'll just play it. Um, I have a capsule uh, to represent a human, and I made them transparent so I could see the lattice through them. You notice as he walks through, um, different parts light up. I even made the like distance refresh rate so how, how often i'm getting distance readings match what's on the spec sheet um so if you wanted to code your own drivers for these lights um all you have to do is extend the single class um, but you notice these three lights are kind of coming in and out and so if i could just play around with color um and see kind of what I liked. So if you wanted to, you could come in here, change up your lights, change up your colors, and get something you like or whatnot. Um, so this was kind of the main big thing I probably spent. Uh, I don't know. I spent a good bit playing around with the code and trying to get the different values right. I'll explain later how this didn't translate as nicely. Um, like I said, I coded for the refresh rate, like 60 milliseconds. Um, because I soldered something incorrectly, I didn't really get that kind of refresh rate. We'll go into that later. So for physical construction, when I first started this project, I had just moved into a new apartment. I didn't have any real tools, so I opted in for buying something that was already pre-made from Home Depot. That was kind of a bad idea. It was poorly made. Um, and overall, the effort I put into like sanding and staining it like it was difficult doing that because it was already constructed. If it was, um, you know, taken apart and done and then put together, uh, I would have had a lot easier time, especially standing like um, in between these little crevices where two pieces of wood meet. It was really annoying. Um, it, the whole thing was only like 12 or $13 from Home Depot. It was like stupid cheap. Um, but yeah, so we ended up having to sand it because uh, like a clone, Upon closer inspection, um, you'll see stuff like uh, marker marks on it or just like pieces of print, uh, like black marks. It didn't look too nice or appealing. So yeah, we ended up, after sanding it, uh, we stained it. 
Uh, the staining was a uh, red chestnut finish. Staining it made it look nice, but it also gave us an opportunity for things to match. So one of the things we did for this project, I bought a wood PLA. So what I could do is print with um, this woodish material, 3D print. Um, and so for anything I needed to be 3D printed, I print it this wood stuff, it would be sanded down and then I'd stain it. And so whatever gets uh, printed out matches the color of the lattice as well. And it worked out pretty nicely. Um, when, a part, when I first started using the PLA, it clogged my nozzle. I had to play with uh, a lot of settings for this type of filament. I'm not a good uh, experienced individual when it comes to 3D printing. Very much a hobbyist, very much an experienced. Um, but I ended up getting something that looks like that, covering the sonar sensor. Uh, it fits over pretty nicely. It, this is kind of it being uh, before sanding, so this is what it looks right out of 3D printing it. And then that's it being sanded, and then that's them being stained. So yeah, you can kind of see it looks like the same color as the rest of the lattice that's been stained. So colors match. Um, I would say if you're interested in printing with wood PLA, uh, don't do it if you think you're going to get like more structural integrity. At least with my settings and my filament, that is totally not the case. The regular plastic PLA, nothing special with it, way stronger than this uh, wood PLA. I can break this easily between my fingers. Um, so I ended up finding a Raspberry Pi case off Thingiverse, printed out, doing the same thing. Um, that's it, stained. And yeah, uh, when I came to covering up my wiring I did for uh, the device, I just printed a basic case and then stained it as well. I ended up just taking both these cases and gluing it to the lattice with some Gorilla Glue, and it worked pretty well. So when it came to wiring this thing, I made a few mistakes, mainly in my, my circuit layout on the PCB. There is wires coming in and like coming up into the PCB, which makes it really ugly and hard to hide <laughs> from the finished product. So. What I should have done is taken these things and then uh, put it at the bottom and tried having everything come in at the bottom of the circuit. There was absolutely no need for to place it at the top. I guess I was just trying to be cute with the spacing and it, it really made it look ugly. Um, for wiring, I put a lot of these notches everywhere so that as I'm feeding uh, wire through, I can just wrap them around this and kind of have sharp 90 degree turns in attempt to hide it behind the lattice. Um, it only worked so well. Yeah, and you see how the LEDs are kind of just hanging there. You know, everything looks like a mess. So yeah, what saved this whole project kind of was this $2 floral tape that just kind of you wrap it around tightly to clean up all the wires. If it wasn't for that, it would have been so it's been a really bad uh, looking project. Um, and it still looks pretty bad around the Raspberry Pi and you can see issues, this weird red stuff that I'll get into later in the project. Um, but yeah, after most of the construction being done, this is sort of what it looked like before decorating it. Um, this is it working. Um, I can turn on all the lights and it, kind of had it in my room just like this for a while because I would turn off the lights and then just have it animate this twinkling little program. It was pretty nice and atmospheric. So yeah, this is the kind of final result of the construction before getting into like decorating and a lot of programming. You can see that it's still pretty ugly, but most of the wires aren't sticking out except for when it gets close to the Raspberry Pi. Um, and my circuit and it looks like a tangled mess and we did our best to cover it up with the decorating holy moly um, but yeah uh, at this point I'm getting uh, consistent uh, distance readings 
I can turn on and off all the lights individually and through pulse width modulation, you know, fade them in and out. So for electrical design, circuit design, I'm not good at this. I took two classes in college. It's been like five years now, uh, but I do know how to work with a breadboard. That's where I began. Um, the sensors you see in front of you is called HCS04. They're sonar sensors. Um, they send out pulses and wait to receive something back. The known issue with this one, and these are cheap sensors. I got 10 of these for $10 and they have a pretty good range. The issue is that if it doesn't get a bounce back, so if you just send it out to the void, um, the sensor will hang or whatnot and you'll never like go low and there people are claiming you have to power cycle it. I personally didn't experience this. If you program for it, you can just calculate, hey, this is, I know the max distance it can read. And if it's taking too long, I know it's exceeded its max, dis max distance, which means it's probably not gonna get anything. Um, I should stop waiting on it. And then I can send another trigger uh, later. Maybe people had issues with it because they're using a Python library that tried to do magic stuff for them. I just coded it all by hand or whatnot. It's stupid easy. You have a lot of tutorials online on how to do it. Um, now, if you spend a few extra dollars and get the SRO5 version, it has five pins instead of four. It's known to not have this issue. Um, just a heads up if you're wanting to build this project. I use the Raspberry Pi 3 for this project. Uh, I love it. It's stupid easy to work with and you can code it in Python. You have all the libraries already kind of loaded into it. So once I got the circuit kind of down on the breadboard and it was working, I then transcribed it to uh, a PCB. I am very bad at soldering and I messed things up that I didn't realize until I was assembling it all. Yeah, it's a pretty basic circuit. It has a, a voltage divider um, for the sonar sensors. The sonar sensors output take five volts and output five volts. And the Raspberry Pi pins are really only supposed to take uh, 3.3 into like the input pins. So you have to use a voltage divider. And so that's what you see this one white wire is getting. Uh, what I was able to do is have all three sonar sensor outputs be put in parallel. So I didn't need three uh, input pins for the Raspberry Pi, I only needed one. What this means though, is I can only run one sonar sensor at a time. That's always the case though. Um, these sonar sensors, if you run them at the same time, even if they're using you know two different input pins for the Raspberry Pi, if these two sonar sensors are running at the same time, uh, they collide and it just causes all funkiness issues. So you can only only run them one at a time. Now, for my application, that doesn't matter at all. The max uh, time one reading can take is 60 milliseconds. And with 3D, three sonar sensors, it means you're only taking 180 milliseconds to go through all three readings. So you can get five updates a second plenty fine for this application. Um, so yeah, all three of the inputs are going to the voltage divider. Uh, I did end up having to use uh, some diodes for some reason. Maybe I did it, maybe I could have wired it differently, uh, but that's what made it work for me. That's how not knowing I am of this whole circuit design stuff. Um, and you see on this side, there's these eight pins that I ended up butchering. So let's look at that. Yeah, so I didn't even really know what Flux was before uh, this project. Uh, I've learned a lot about soldering uh, since starting this. It, this is really not pretty. I am not proud of this at all. Um, and so here are the eight pins. All these eight pins were supposed to take is the output of the LEDs, so the lights you see, and put it into like ground for the Raspberry Pi. Um, so they could all, all these uh, lights were connected in parallel or, or pseudo. The, eight, I had to have eight output pins to control each uh, LED individually 
but in the end, all of them get connected to ground. Um, for some reason, this isn't soldered properly, and so that only these top four pins really got the ground, um, not the other four. So only four of my LEDs could work at a time, and how I resolved that was trying to clamp five pins into one and then connect it. So what that looks like is this. I have five inputs going into one output. And so I then combine that with the remaining uh, three uh, LEDs to fit within those four, if that makes any sense. Um, it wasn't pretty. And thank God there's a thing called Wago clips or Wago or Wagyu beef clips, whatever. They're amazing um, and clean this up a lot. This thing didn't hold together. I tried crimping them and it stayed for a little bit until I tweaked it a little bit and then it all fell out. It was very horrific. Um, and that's what you see in some of my other pictures is that horrible monstrosity sticking out. Um, yeah, you see that freaking cat. It's not liking it. Uh, but yeah, so that's kind of what I had to do with this thing. For the lights, the lattice use, I ended up using these super bright uh, LEDs. I decided on the color yellow. I got them from Adafruit, and you can see the link in the description. But if they hit you right in the eye, like, you go blind. It is stupid bright, and they can take 3.3 volts, so it works perfectly with the Raspberry Pi. Um, and you can kind of see the bottom four LEDs were what I was originally using. They can take, like, a max of, like, 1.8 volts, but the um, top four are the super bright, and it's, like, throwing off the camera. <laughs> They're so bright. Like, oh, my God. And you'll see in other shots that the LEDs are just flipping bright. It, it will easily illuminate a good portion of the room. It's, it's really great, um, honest to God, but you might not like that. You know, it all depends on what you're trying to accomplish. But uh, I was very happy with that purchase. I did add in another component in the last second on a whim. It was a Raspberry Pi 3 camera. Um, I think it's like the camera version 2 or something, and it's like $20, it fits in, you import like Pi Camera or something in your code, and it works like that, and now it, this is turned into a security device. So if you want to do Raspberry Pi 3 development, a super easy and useful tool to use is Visual Studio's code. Uh, what you can do is when you launch your editor, it will automatically like SSH, log into your Pi, and then set up an environment. Um, right now, if you want this functionality, at the time of recording, it's on Visual Studio Code Insider, which is kind of like their beta features. Um, so, but that might change in the future. The regular SSHing feature exists in regular Visual Studio's code, but that only exists for like regular things like uh, regular Linux server or uh, containers if you're into Docker. And a super cool feature is that any extensions you install uh, while ssh get installed onto what you're ssh into. So if I install all my extensions on my Raspberry Pi, then I could get on another computer, and this is what I did a lot, is I was on my, switching between my desktop and my laptop, and I just launched Visual Studio's Code Insiders, it automatically SSHs into the Pi and then sets up the environment like I, uh, had on my desktop when I got on my laptop, um, and I can just start programming right away again. It's a really super cool synced IDE. Um, I, I can't like praise it enough, it was great. So if you wanna animate your lights to fade in and out or dim or uh, do anything other than just be on, for the Raspberry Pi, unfortunately, you have to use something called pulse width modulation. Regular pins on the Raspberry Pi only have on and off mode. You can't set uh, the voltage from a pin to be like 0.7. It's either 0 or 3.3. And these lights don't have any special functionality where if you send it a certain wave, 
of on and off, it's going to set the light to render at 70%. So you have to use something called pulse width modulation, um, which just basically turns on and off the pin super fast. The longer the pin is on, you know, obviously the more power you're sending to the LED. So if you have a pulse width modulation of like 100% or one like it's always going to be on it's like just turning the pin on and the light will be at full brightness um, so if you think of like 50% pulse width modulation it's only on half the time and it's you know just turning on and off really quickly and the the LED should only be at 50% brightness in reality that doesn't really work because it takes some power just to get the LED started and so like if you sent like uh, pulse width modulation of 0.1 or 10%, like you wouldn't even see anything. It works good enough. So if you wanted to like do a fade in and out effect, all you do is a sine wave and you clamp it between zero and one and you feed the sine wave time and then you multiply it by how fast you want it to twinkle. Um, and that's a really easy way to just get some effects going. Um, so like I said, in the design phase, I kind of copied and pasted the c -sharp code into Python and cleaned it up a little bit, which kind of was more trouble than it was worth, and it made some things awkward, but um, what are you going to do? So you can see here, I'm defining my LED pins. If you're building this, obviously you would want to change this. Same with the um, different uh, sonar sensor stuff. So this is what I was talking about. You get uh, three trigger pins, uh, one for each sonar sensor. And so you send it a trigger and then you listen on the echo. And then if it, if it takes too long to get anything, then you know that it's timed out and you just can resend another trigger. At least that's what solved it for me. Um, now, my soldering was poor and it seemed like if I, I couldn't just wait, these things were interfering with each other. So I actually have longer waits um, because it seemed like one of the pins were like overriding the other. I don't know, it was stupid weird. Um, but if, if you build the circuit correctly, I assume <laughs> you don't have to add these extra weights. So I bought a $20 Raspberry Pi camera. This is like the camera version two. Um, and you know, developing with the Raspberry Pi is stupid easy. This library already came installed with Raspbian, and I just import it, and you basically just say, um, take picture. And it snaps a JPEG, and then I upload it. So this program runs a Telegram bot. Telegram is just a messaging app. I added this bot to a group chat with me and my girlfriend, so that like, we can set uh, the mode of the uh, lights how we want it. Um, also in security mode, if you trigger it, so the sonar sensors pick up something, uh, the video that it takes gets sent to the uh, group chat so that both me and her can uh, see what it's uh, taken. So if you look at the security controller, it's pretty simple. Also, oh my God. I had to freaking use mutexes in Python. That was silly. It's it's asynchronous. I don't think, I'm pretty sure it's not actually doing real multi-threading, but uh, you can send commands to take pictures and you can also, it will take pictures on its own because of the sonar sensor. So there could be an opportunity for it trying to take a picture twice or take a picture with a video and that's no good. So, um, I'd use a mutex, um, I acquire it, I send a message saying it was tripped, I try recording a video, um, if, it, if for some reason it airs out, it will alert me, and you can try taking a video um, just manually, and it releases. So that's all the security controller is. It's pretty simple. I The controllers all implement this one method, get PWM values for pulse width modulation, for this one, I just set it to return zero. Keep the lights off. I don't want any attention drawn to any perpetrator in my apartment. So I keep them off. That's not the case for other controllers like 
uh, the twinkle, which will just fade in and out different lights. You can see how simple it is to like make these types of controllers. Um, and you can even, you know, there's different parameters you can configure for these controllers. Um, and this is also generic, so I'm not even, this controller doesn't really know, like, um, I didn't hard code the number of lights. It's passed in at runtime. And the proximity one is where it got ugly, translating it from C sharp to Python because of math. Um, and I'm just a big dumb dumb. So have fun looking at that if you want to improve this proximity code. And this just basically means as you walk by the lights, it's gonna, you know, if you're walking on the left side, it's only going to light up the left lights. And if you're on the right side, it's only gonna light up the right lights and all that. Um, so that's what this code does. The Telegram bot was stupid simple to make. I obviously didn't make it from scratch. I use a library. You should go check it out on GitHub. It's, they made it as easy as it could be. Um, and you can see the polling and then the sleeping. Uh, because I soldered things poorly uh, and the interference with different sensors, I found that adding the sleep made me get accurate readings for distance. Yeah, so I end up starting two threads, quote unquote threads, off the main thread. Uh, one for the bot and the other for the light controller. And the main thread runs the distance reading, constantly updating. So there's a lot of, a lot of stuff going on for a really small application. I used a, like a null value or no distance uh, to be represented as negative 666. So if I ever saw the distance, that was negative 666. I knew that the distance reader timed out and I had to, you know, re-trigger. If you want to make this and use this program, you're gonna have to set an environment variable, um, which is the telegram token. So you go to the bot father and he will assign you a token when you create a bot and you use that so that this library knows uh, what to send the messages to. But yeah, I hope you see that it's stupid easy to make like your own controllers. So if you had an idea for um, making your own thing, you can prototype it inside of Unity, you know, write some C-sharp, play around, and then once you got something you like, you can come over here in Python and then crank it out, you know, uh, build out your lights, don't make the mistakes I did, <laughs> learn how to solder. Um, and all that good stuff. But yeah, I would love to hear what comments you guys have. If you saw any other places I messed up, I would love to hear just so I can learn <laughs> and whatnot. Um, or any cool ideas that I could maybe implement in the future. Uh, thank you so much for watching to the end. Um, consider subscribing. I'm trying to actually uh, try pumping out a project like every two months.